Good afternoon. My name is Jos Delbeke, and I'm pleased to welcome you to the fourth climate session of this State of the Union conference. And today we will have a very important guest. Our guest is Mr. Werner Hoyer, the president of the European Investment Bank. And he will be interviewed by Sasha Vakulina from Euronews. Now, this debate fits very well in the context that was created by Vice President Timmermans this morning. And I would like to recall three points. The first point is that the EU is going to a 55% reduction by 2030 based on 1990. But now the real work really starts. The real work is that policy measures must be formulated and the Commission will come with eight policy proposals by the 14th of July. The second point is that, and that is the context of the debate for a banker, is that the investments are so important and in particular the investments in low carbon innovation and the deployment of low carbon innovation massively. The European Commission's uh, impact assessment outlined that some 350 billion per year only in the energy sector will be necessary. So good banking operations, good financing operations are really important. And the third element is the international dimension. Also this morning, I think that Mr. Timmermans was uh, underlining very strongly how important it is to cooperate with uh, the whole world, but in particular with developing countries and their sustainable finance is very important. So sustainable finance is important for Europe, but not least important for all the regions outside Europe and in particular the European neighborhood. And so the EIB, as you will hear from Mr. Hoyer, has a mission to develop itself as a sustainable development bank. And that is really an exciting perspective. So please watch with me the following recorded uh, conversation between Mr. Werner Hoyer and uh, Sasha Vakulina. Thank you. When it comes to Europe in a changing world and its economic recovery post-COVID-19 crisis and the further development, what's crucial here is the EU Green Deal and its climate ambitions. And what's crucial to those is the European Investment Bank. And I'm now joined by its president, Werner Hoyer. President Hoyer, thank you for being here at the State of the Union. Well, thank you very much for the invitation. This is exciting and a great honor for me. President Hoyer, it has been half a year since the Climate Bank Roadmap was published and a year and a half since uh, the European Investment Bank changed its energy lending policy. Looking back at those game-changing decisions, what kind of reaction or impact has most surprised you there? Well, first of all, I was surprised that after I went to the United Nations General Assembly to the Climate Summit, it announced there that we would go consequently on the Paris alignment track and that would we, we would stop fossil fuel financing. Um, I was surprised that I got the full support of the, of the board immediately afterwards and uh, the governor supported this thing, which was not easy for them in particular since we have completely different situations in the 27 member states of the European Union. And then the climate bank roadmap last year went through very, very quickly. Uh, Obviously, this decision of EIB came at the right point in time. It was mature to do so. And we see from the reactions now from other international development banks, multilateral development banks, that uh, they are following more or less on, on that track. Uh, there is still lots of alignment necessary between the multilateral development banks, but we must do this together in the run-up to Glasgow and uh, make sure that we are not surpassed by the private sector because sometimes I have the feeling the private sector is ahead of us. And is the European Investment Bank on track to deliver on those truly game-changing decisions? Yes, we are. And uh, we have, that's very important because we have a reputation of, of, of a delivery bank and therefore we must deliver. And uh, failure is not an option here. We, we are happy to be on that track. Uh, although it's going to be a long way because we need to see the climate bank roadmap in close contact with the, um, with, with the provision of 
uh, help for those countries who have the biggest issues with our decisions. Because it's quite obviously quite obvious that we are still have countries in the European Union who are very much dependent upon fossil fuels and uh, their transition must be organized and uh, there we must play a crucial role. And let me ask you on some of those decisions. The European Investment Bank has announced in the CBR they will align with the taxonomy to determine the climate share of the investment and it will align with the disclosure rules. Does that imply that the European Investment Bank will fund only projects that fall within the remit described by the taxonomy? Or will the European Investment Bank set an example in that? Because that's a really uh, the issue that really caused lots of conversations and lots of controversy around. We are strong supporters of the idea of a taxonomy. And I'm not talking about a bureaucratic monster. I'm talking about something that gives assurances to the investors. When we need to involve the private sector much more in climate policies and climate financing, then we must give the investors reassurances that what is called a green project contains green. And this requires rules. We have an experience with that because in 2007, our colleagues here at the EIB invented green bonds. We were the first issuers of green bonds and were still one of the largest issuers of green bonds today. And we found out quickly after 2007 that there were uh, other institutions who would do some sor sort of greenwashing. And of course, that costs your credibility with the investors. They need to have reassurances. So therefore, clean, honest reporting is name of the game. Transparency and accountability are name of the game. And this is something which I welcome with the taxonomy because that gives them a Europe-wide uh, platform. And I believe it is going to become a global one very soon. So I'm very happy about uh, this development because without giving reassurances to the private sector, we will not be able to raise the money that we so urgently need. Taxpayers' money alone will not do the trick. When it comes to uh, taxonomy, there's been, of course, this recent debates about gas and nuclear within it. How you famously said gas is over, and I'm quoting you on this one. Uh, any further thoughts on, on this issue? Well, I'm, I'm aware that for countries which, for instance, heavily depend upon uh, coal f f power plants, uh, gas is uh, progress. Uh, and of course, that can be then a transition uh, situation. But um, you must not hide, hide behind that. And I sometimes have the feeling that behind the argument of organizing the transition, uh, people are hiding. Uh, because at the end of the day, uh, also fossil fuel uh, energy installations must be financed. And uh, when I had a discussion with private sector banks and insurance companies, by the way, uh, on this issue, uh, they told me quite clearly, how can you expect us private sector banks to finance fossil fuel installations, put these uh, investments onto our balance sheet for the next 30 or 40 years, when we know exactly that in 10 or 15 years, we have to take it off the balance sheet and write it off. Therefore, we are producing losses. And for a public bank like us, a multilateral development bank like us, it means that we put a burden on the taxpayer uh, 15 or 10 years from now. And this is something that would be irresponsible. So we must get going with the, with the change. Also, because uh, the uh, climate change is obviously the defining future of our times. Uh, we, have, we have had six years since 2015, which were the hottest years on record. Uh, and uh, this has consequences which are not only environmental. It has consequences on the economic side, on the health side, the social justice side, human rights side. So we must get more ambitious. And what were the arguments that you gave to them when they expressed those concerns about the situation within the next 10 or 15 years when it comes to companies, insurers, as you said? Yeah, well, um, obviously, we have to make sure that our um, resolve to bring about the change, which needs to be technological change, is not based on romanticism or ideology. It's based on economics. It's simply not good economics 
to put money into a project that you have on the balance sheets for 30 years and you have to write it off after 15 years. So this is a pretty convincing argument. On the other hand, there is a counter side to it. The counter side means that if you do that, you need to invest heavily in technology and innovation. And uh, for me, this is key in the following context. Uh, the, the Europeans are still pretty much ahead when it comes to the climate technologies. We need to, Im, to impl, Im, deploy these climate technologies around the world in order to take advantage of our edge, which we have on technology. This is one of the few areas where we have an edge. In many other areas like digitalization, we, we have almost lost it. We are far behind. And all in all, we are investing one and a half percentage points of our GDP less into innovation in Europe than our counterparts or competitors in other parts of the world are doing. So therefore, we must see the, the context between uh, financing of innovation, financing of development, and that is therefore a global effort that we need to take. Yeah, but when it comes to those innovations, and particularly, as you said, when it comes to climate innovations, low carbon innovations, what is the special role that the European Investment Bank can play there as of now? And also, at the same time, let me get your view on maybe three to five years from now. What is it that you will want to push for more for the, for the European Investment Bank role there when it comes to those innovations? Well, we are not the only ones in the world. So therefore, this is an effort we have to address together. And therefore, I'm in constant talks with my colleagues from the other multilateral development banks, but also with the private sector. And we move in the same direction. Only then can we, do, can we produce the miracle, the miracle that is necessary. Because let just take the, the, the figures for last year. We had a terrible economic and health crisis last year. We had a huge fall in, in uh, international air travel, significant changes in commuting patterns and everything. And the International Energy Agency estimates that we had only 8% fall in gre uh, greenhouse gas emissions. So even under these terrible economic circumstances, but we know if we want to reach our targets by 2030, then we need this kind of reduction of 8% every year, even with a then hopefully booming economy. So we need to introduce technological change as soon as possible. And we try to focus our activity in particular in this field. Indeed, because when it comes even given everything that has been happening for over a year now in Europe, in the European Union, around the world with the crisis and how wide ranging it is, we have seen the EU changing actually the target and going in more ambitious from uh, 2050 to 2030. I mean, this is very encouraging, but it, it requires action. And in some parts of the world, I don't see that action yet. And even we in Europe can do more. We need to do more on this in order to reach the, the objectives. And therefore, uh, in order to, to set the pace, we have decided that uh, by 2030, we'll have, we will have triggered uh, investment of uh, 1 trillion euros in, in the field of uh, climate action, environmental sustainability, and uh, uh, in neighboring fields. Uh, so this is the first ob obligation that we have put onto our own shoulders. And secondly, we have said by 2050, uh, by 2025, we will reach 50% of all operations in the field of, uh, of uh, climate and environment and uh, biodiversity. And thirdly, we have said it doesn't make sense to put 50% of your activities into climate change and environmental activities if the other 50% of your business have a detrimental effect on this. So therefore, we have also uh, made sure that EIB has been already now for five months Paris aligned with all our activities. And this means that uh, we, have, uh, we have put our uh, vision into concrete business plans for the next 10 years. One of the important issues and, and aspects in this bigger ambitions, of course, is uh, the, just the transition itself. And in the Climate Bank Roadmap, the European Investment Bank subscribes to the Just Transition Agenda and expresses its support for the Just Transition Mechanism, of course, the one that we know about from the European Union. What is the uh, European Investment Bank precisely doing to make this a just transition? Well, we focus... Uh, considerably intensively on the countries which are most negatively affected by this 
changing energy pattern. And uh, this is uh, uh, this is absolutely necessary. Look at uh, the situation in, in, in coal countries. Uh, the I mean the, the the last coal miner who will get out of the of, of, of the mine in a couple of years, he will not be able to to lead a digital startup within a couple of weeks. So we must bring support for the industrial setup, but also for the people living there and working there. And therefore, many of our um, projects go in this direction. We have very good examples because we have done it in the past already, long before we thought about the climate bank roadmap. Uh, we have been working, for instance, in the Polish municipality of Katowice for over 20 years. And uh, there have been many loans going there uh, to uh, contribute to its successful transition from a stagnating coal mining town to a vibrant urban center, offering new businesses opportunities and a healthier environment for the citizens. So these are projects that we focus on and now with the Climate Bank Roadmap even more. Or, or um, we have these projects not only in countries in which have joined the European Union recently. For instance, in my own country in Germany, we have cases like this, where this kind of transition help was and is needed. And therefore, we team up with the European Commission with Ursula von der Leyen on the issue of just transition. Are you concerned that when it comes to some of those countries that you have just mentioned, so that really heavily rely on it, when it comes to their just transition, that they might be thrown a little bit backwards because of everything that's been happening over the past year and their own economic slowdowns and probably the focus of some of their policies and strategies? Well, this is why they, they need our support more than ever. But on the other hand, this terrible virus has opened our eyes. It has been a wake-up call for us in many aspects because we are seeing gaps and weaknesses in our economic, societal, and technological setup. And that means that when we now go towards recovery and resilience uh, and all the measures that the European Union has uh, announced, then we must not have the ambition of returning to where we were before the pandemic, but we must use this opportunity to change and produce progress. Uh, and uh, therefore, for the countries, for instance, in, in, in regions where coal is still a dominant factor, it will be an opportunity to make a quantum leap, so to speak, a leapfrog development in the industrial and technological setup. And uh, I'm sure that some of the countries which are considering uh, the, this transition a big challenge and danger for them will come out as the strongest. There are also calls uh, to make the European Investment Bank a sustainable development bank. What are your thoughts on that one? Well, uh, link development and climate. And you come to the conclusion that if we want to save this planet, it's not enough that the Europeans get clean. We produce 10% of global gas house, green, uh, uh, gas, uh, greenhouse gas uh, emissions, 10%. So if we want to be safe on this planet soon, then we need to convince the rest of the world and help the rest of the world to get there. I'm, I'm very optimistic now that with the new climate goals pronounced by the Biden administration uh, and also uh, now all of a sudden by, by China and other players will follow, uh, this, there will be new speed in this, in this development. But if you want to help developing countries in this context, then you must move in with top technologies. And therefore, I always see the link between innovation, climate, and technology we need, uh, and development. We need to convince uh, our partners in the world that we can help them to organize a courageous, ambitious transition. Because only if we address the 90% non-European greenhouse emissions uh, then we will uh, be successful with the uh, uh, SDGs and in particular the climate objectives. Uh, President Hoare, let me ask you, you've mentioned that, of course, the, uh, the Biden administration in the U.S. What's your take and what, what are your expectations now with uh, President Biden there and the new agenda and also the fact that, of course, the United States is back at the climate talks table? I had a very intensive discussion uh, this this week with uh, John Kerry and Gina McCarthy on, on these issues. And I must say, I'm delighted and excited 
uh, not only that the United States is, is, is back on the stage of multilateralism, but in particular that it's back in the, in the climate uh, action business, uh, that has been missed for the last years. And uh, that has had an effect, for instance, also on other multilateral development banks. The EIB has the huge advantage and the unique advantage of being owned by EU member states only. So we were able to set the course here. In the World Bank or in most regional development banks, uh, you have uh, a huge uh, wide shareholdership. And for instance, the US had an influence that was more standing on the brakes than uh, pushing the process forward. This has changed now. So I'm encouraged that the United States will exert uh, its influence on the other multilateral development banks as well. So uh, this is extremely encouraging. And on, on the climate objectives, there is now a pretty good alignment between the European Union and the US. And uh, that encourages me a lot. It makes me enthusiastic because I've missed the US on the global scene uh, in times when we observe enormous uh, tectonic changes in world power, in world politics, in world economics. And uh, if we want to preserve the model of the West, the community of enlightenment-based, rule of law abiding, human rights respecting democracies, then we need the United States of America. Is there any particular um, sector or particular aspect of this cooperation when it comes to the European Union and the European Investment Bank and the US that you are looking forward to? when it comes, of course, to climate oh. and development? Well, obviously, we are now realigning. And first of all, uh, this is a political question that needs to be answered by our political masters. We follow the political steer of the Council and the Commission and Parliament. But of course, uh, I see that uh, the, the focus on technology is something that uh, uh, we must take uh, into the center of our activities more because there the U United States is both a competitor and a partner and that partnership needs to be further developed. Uh, as I said, we are far behind when it comes to digitalization, for instance, we can learn from the Americans there. I think when it comes to climate technologies, we can team up with them and uh, invite them to join the boat that uh, we have prepared. Let me go back to a little bit to CBR. There is a chapter there that has received uh, little attention so far, and it is the Shadow Carbon Prize that will be used in project appraisal. And this is where I wanted to ask you, there, is, there are some certain interesting things about starting at 18, 20, 20, 250, 20, 30, and so on, which is unprecedented indeed. Uh, what impact do you expect from this? And can you give us an example which projects will be ruled out, for example, on that one? Well, we have to be clear that the shadow cost of carbon must be a key technical parameter in our economic assessment of projects. And we in EIB, we are doing it for a long time, and this is now gaining uh, ground. And it's necessary to see that uh, if we want to internalize negative external effects of economic action, then we must do that via the price system. And therefore, uh, the shadow cost of carbon is key. And uh, the way that works in the bank is that we apply an economic test for an appraising alone, confirming the, that the expected benefits of the, of the project uh, out, outweigh the, the social costs. And with the revised shadow carbon values, net emissions from a project will be valued at a shadow cost of carbon that is consistent with the path towards uh, 2050 to uh, neutra climate neutra neutrality, and that's what we all want to achieve. So, um, the famous ice hockey player Wayne Gretzky once said, I don't run where the puck is, I run where it will be. So, by providing a clear path how to shadow carbon price, uh, how the carbon price will evolve over the coming years, we are giving firms a clear signal what, where they need to be running if they want to continue to have access to EIB funding. And therefore, the political awareness of the importance of uh, the shadow price is enormous and should not be underestimated. What kind of, uh, what kind of uh, reaction and response you maybe already have or you're expecting to get from those projects regarding this? 
I must say because, that of course, you know, we... when I looked at that, it's, uh, I mean, it, it, it is unprecedented, but I'm really uh, trying to get the practical, and I really want to hear from that side as well, and what you've heard from them. Well, at first, the reaction with many people was shock and awe. I mean, uh, it is, uh, of course, breathtaking to see that uh, if you start with the carbon price of, of, of 80 uh, in 2020, and uh, over time you arrive at 800 in, in 2050, then this is the shock. On the other hand, something like this idea, you, you see that it will come, but you better prepare for it, will, in, will speed up your own transition activ activities and mobilize your creativity. And this exactly is happening. Uh, if we can assume that the, the carbon price will remain at 80 for the next uh, 30 years, then there is no incentive to move to better technologies and to less consumption of natural resources. So it's the first shock and then more understanding and more getting into yeah, that. Look, look, for instance, in the automotive industry. Yeah. How fast it is moving now. Uh, a couple of years ago, uh, non-diesel or non-gas consuming cars were considered almost a dream or an illusion or whatever. And now the majority of the cars in, in Europe are being admitted to the, to the transportation system are already on that path. So if you set the right economic incentives, then you can reach the objectives. For me, it is important that we don't uh, go via regulations and bans, but via economic incentives. We must make a business case out of climate action. Well, that's interesting. Let me ask you on that one. I understand, of course, for those projects and so many companies and sectors when it comes to globally, but we are talking mostly about the European Union here, of course. Of course, incentives work really well. But should those incentives as well be paired with uh, regulations or strict regulations? Where is this balance and this thin line? I think, I, don't get me wrong, regulation is necessary. And I think the European Union does a great job in, the, in this respect. But what we should stay away from, and the, the political temptation is always there, mm. is to leave the pattern of technology, neutral, technology neutrality. Politicians and bureaucrats in the European Union should not decide which kind of technologies will be successful in 2030, 2040, 2050. So this needs to be done via economic incentives. And um, there the market functions better than the best political will. Uh, let me ask you about uh, another, another aspect here. According to the impact assessment of the Commission, we need roughly 3% of additional energy investment every year in the next decade to be on the path to net zero. This is huge. This is huge indeed. And this, as I said before, requires more than taxpayers' money. This requires the mobilization of the entire world, of the entire ecosystem. And uh, I can give you an example which is even uh, stronger than, than the one you just gave, and that's impressive enough. Look at the energy needs for Africa. If we, for instance, want to give the hydrogen energy a serious chance, and I'm talking about green hydrogen, then we must multiply the electricity production in Africa within the next 10 to 15 years by the factor of five. This is enormous. And you can do that by setting up uh, Chinese uh, uh, coal power plants in Africa or uh, new liquid gas production uh, from other parts of the world in, in, in East Africa and the uh, sustainable development goals of the United Nations, including the climate goals, will go up in flames. So if we, if we avoid that, then we better mobilize lots of money for top technologies, for financing a le leapfrog development in, in Africa, and make sure that we can produce clean electricity for Africa. Yeah, but also at the same time, when looking, uh, looking over this past year, and of course the COVID-19 crisis, which very quickly turned into the COVID-19 economic crisis and of, as well the crisis of investment. We've seen that that one was going down, was going slower than usual. How to, you know, how to deal with that one with slowing down and reduced investment in the private sector? Well, of course, as the EU bank uh, and the bank that is particularly well equipped uh, on the innovation side and in particular life sciences, we had to meet uh, this challenge uh, immediately and head on because our, uh, the member states of the European Union expected us to be able to 
make sure that small companies, medium-sized companies, which are basically solid and vibrant, will not be killed by this crisis only because of a medium-term liquidity crisis. So we set up several mechanisms in order to make sure that liquidity will not run out for these companies, together with national promotional institutions and member states and the European Union. This is the one side. The other side is 15 months from now, none of us knew how you would spell COVID correctly. And all of a sudden we were challenged with, for instance, the need to produce vaccines or help produce vaccines for that. By the way, also help medication, help with diagnostics and all these things. So it was a huge challenge and speed is of the essence here. And we, we, since we were are traditionally very strong on, on, on life science projects, uh, we were first in line when it came to financing the production of vaccines. And I must say with, uh, for instance, Q, uh, BioNTech or CureVac coming up and other companies uh, in Europe and outside of Europe, we have made a record progress uh, as far as time is needed to produce and develop new vaccines. This is amazing. And this effort is a huge effort of the, co of the entire European Union, where we are proud to have been playing a strong part. And uh, that, of course, is necessary to address before we um, can expect positive impacts of the, uh, of the efforts on, on climate. But uh, there is a tendency in some parts of the European Union and in the world to hide behind the virus when it comes to the necessary climate action. Well, with, with this approach and with these examples, and of course this burning issue of the COVID-19 situation all around the world and in Europe, when you just mentioned those projects, shouldn't it be like a little, shouldn't more banks become kind of climate and development banks like the European Investment Bank there? Well, uh, we are not so self-centered that we would uh, say everybody should do the same thing as we are doing. We should cooperate and do it well, but I, I observe with great pleasure that the banking scenery has changed totally. When I met uh, finance people from, from private institutions like banks and insurance companies in Davos a few years ago, and I was wondering why you're sitting around at a climate event in Davos, uh, they said, well, this is going to be key for, our, for the preservation of our future. And therefore you now see the, the CEO of BlackRock addressing the CEOs of this world with the need to move out of fossil fuel financing. You see other institutions under the leadership of Mark Carney to move towards a very, very ambitious package for, for, for Glasgow. So in some situations, and when I travel around Europe, in some countries I have the feeling in, there are areas where the private sector is ahead of us. And therefore, the, as, a, as a multilateral development bank, we can only encourage us to um, co better cooperate, better align, and arrive at common standards. And for that, for instance, the taxonomy will be decisive. As well as we have pushed through the green bond uh, principles uh, a decade ago, we must now make sure that we get a, 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 a ambitious approach on the taxonomy and on, on global standards. And the first ones who need to get together on this are the multilateral development banks. And uh, we are in very, very close cooperation and consultation with them. And now that the U.S. has taken off the foot of the brake, uh, I'm optimistic that we can achieve uh, the mobilization of the public sector banks as well. Well, I've got an impression myself that uh, over the past year with the coronavirus situation and the global pandemic, that this push when it comes to the private sector, that it only accelerated, even though the circumstances were not that favorable in many cases. Indeed, and it's uh, sometimes you... you as, as terrible as this crisis is, uh, you can see that it sometimes sets free forces and energy that would not have been expected, or it encourages people to do things uh, for which they normally would not have the courage to address. President Howard, you've mentioned here a couple of times during our conversation the upcoming Glasgow event, of course. Let me ask you, Andewa, what's your, what are your big expectations for that one? And what are your big expectations probably on a bit of a bigger picture and probably global picture 
for the next, uh, for the nearest years, let's say like up to three years now, when it comes to this bigger international push cooperation, and also there is the particular case there of uh, uh, neighboring partner countries, of course, when it comes to European Investment Bank as well. So let me take this into a bigger uh, context and ask you what's coming and what are you looking forward to? Well, Glasgow can be a real game changer or at least a big boost for the common activities that uh, the, the, the leaders who came together under the American leadership uh, this week or last week have shown. I think um, it will be key to produce the link between our climate ambitions, which are rather Europe-centric on the one hand, and the innovation activities in Europe and export of these technologies outside of Europe and then development. Never separate innovation, climate and development. And Glasgow can give a great push to that. And I hope that we can play a good part. And on the neighboring partners, when it, uh, neighboring partner countries when it comes to the European Union, what's, uh, I just, can you give us some of the maybe recent examples when it comes to, to those projects there and the policies? Well, as you know, the European Investment Bank has been in, active in developing countries for, for six, more than 60 years. We have uh, a huge portfolio outside the EU. And if you look at, for instance, the, the big solar projects in, in Morocco or so, we have been in there for, for decades, or in this case, decades. Uh, and this is, co of course, going to continue. We are presently uh, having uh, 10 percent, uh, 10, 10 billion euros of activities per year uh, in the developing world, of which uh, 50 to 60 percent are devoted to climate or digital action. And uh, that means basically to frog leap development. And this must be further explored in the neighboring countries. This is particularly true. Uh, there, however, we do not need to reinvent the wheel. We are very active in this field for a very long time and have a good reputation there. When it comes to climate change and fighting it and the Green Deal and greener investment and the bigger picture of transformation development and bigger, greener economic growth, it's all about producing a miracle that is necessary and producing it together. The president of the European Investment Bank, Werner Hoer, here at the State of the Union conference. Thank you so much for this interview. Thank you very much. It was a great pleasure.